right, buenos dias mis amigos. Okay, today I'm going to go over three videos with three different guys at three different churches. And I'm going to show you they're all ignorant and teaching falsely. All right, first up is going to be Pastor Randy Smith. Now, I don't want you to judge him because of his you know mechanic shirt or whatever you want to call that all right so we're not gonna judge him by his appearance okay we're gonna judge him by what he says now let's listen to what he says it tends to be the preachers preach more towards the end of the book than the middle or the beginning and so i think that uh, there may be some familiarity here. As we look at Revelation chapter 20, what we're looking at is the transition from the tribulation period into the millennial reign. And so uh, as, we, as we think about the tribulation, tribulation has come, uh, the city has been, uh, the, 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 the harlot has been... Alright, so he, obviously he has no idea. So what he's saying is that Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and then there's a seven year tribulation followed by a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ um, and obviously um, that's not supported by the Bible at all and I can't help but wonder is this guy getting his doctrine from a Hollywood movie starring Nicolas Cage seriously because what he's describing is not in the Bible at all. All right, let's move in on to number two, and uh, looks like we got Kyle Swanson, and he's got the black shirt. We're not going to judge the black shirt. We're going to judge what he says. He gave a comparison of some of the common views on the end times, and I hope that was helpful for you. Pastor Todd then came in and he carried on the story of what happens after the rapture and that is that seven year period known as the great tribulation that time of divine wrath being poured out on the kingdom of this world unlike anything we have ever seen in church history and unlike anything we will ever see again afterward all right so again he's he's uh teaching the same thing that randy smith is teaching and that is this idea of a seven year tribulation after the rapture. <clears throat> Alright, now think about that. Hopefully, I don't have to replay those, but I could replay them a hundred times and they're going to say the same thing that seven year tribulation occurs after the rapture yet in Matthew 24 it says immediately after the tribulation then we have the angels gathering together the elect now this either Jesus is lying or these people are lying and isn't it odd that what they're describing is exactly what we're what we see in the Hollywood movie called left behind in <laughs> does it even matter what Jesus says to me it does and it, it could not be more obvious immediately after the tribulation then comes the rapture these guys got it backwards why so it can fit their Hollywood movie narrative all right here we got Paul Morrison there will be a seven-year tribulation period between the rapture and, and the Battle of Armageddon and uh, then after that battle is when Christ will set up his kingdom. But all of these things are exciting. I've always thought it'd be an exciting thing, an event, to be alive when the rapture takes place. You know, we may, I don't know if we have the time today, but in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, also in, in 2 Corinthians, or excuse me, 1 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, we see the rapture not in that word, but in description, how Christ will come back in the clouds to, to catch away his children. Because when the tribulation period unfolds, God's, God's children won't have to experience the wrath that God has planned for those who have rejected him. So that's a little bit confusing right there. <clears throat> he says that when the tribulation period unfolds, that God's children will have to experience the wrath. And will have to experience the wrath that God has planned for those who have rejected him. Oh, uh, I don't know what he's saying there. God's children will have to experience the wrath that God... Children will have to experience the wrath that God has planned for those who have rejected him. So is he calling God's children those who reject him? I don't know. And what an exciting thing. Have you ever thought about that in your mind? Just be walking along one day and phew, gone. Maybe you're driving a car. Go. I mean, when, when the rapture happens, you even think about it. I mean, there'll be car accidents everywhere. There'll be airplanes crashing. Well, hopefully the co pilot's lost. Amen. Hopefully, <clears throat> excuse me. Hopefully, the everywhere. there'll be airplanes crashing. Well, hopefully the co pilot's lost. Amen. Hopefully the co pilot something. I. Well, in the movie, The Left Behind, uh, the co-pilot is Nicolas Cage. But the implication is that those guys that are left behind are not saved. Alright? So, why would you say hopefully the co-pilot can... can I, is he saying fly us or, or is saved? It's everywhere. There'll be airplanes crashing. Well, hopefully the coal pilot's lost, amen. Uh, I don't know what he says exactly, but... Uh, you know, there's a, there's a problem. Something deep in these guys' heart... They reveal themselves as not trusting the Word of God. And cast into the lake of fire, and or not into the lake of fire, uh, but... They've been done away. That influence is gone. Jesus has declared victory, and now he has set up his kingdom. Uh, he's ruling and reigning, and so as we move into Revelation chapter 20, that's where we're going to go. Uh, some things just to consider as we move into Revelation chapter 20 is that there, there are uh, people who will go from the tribulation into the millennial reign. Uh, and so as we read some of this tonight, understand that we're not quite yet to the new heavens and the new earth. And so there, there is still a presence of sinfulness. There still is, um, we'll talk about this a little bit, there's still death uh, in a way. And so all of those things still exist during the millennial, during the millennium. And so just as we consider that tonight. And so we'll pick it up in Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 1. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. Verse 2. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And so what is important to note here is that this is an angel doing the work. Uh, so often we like to consider that um, Satan is this big... Uh, scary thing, which he is for us. Satan is very big, very scary. We, sh we should not uh, tempt him, but we... Listen. We like to consider that um, Satan is this big... Uh, scary thing, which he is for us. Satan is very big, very scary. We, sh we should not uh, tempt him, but... We should not tempt him. <clears throat> now, it's a, it right there. That's a that's a red flag, buddy. You just sort of gave yourself away, didn't you? Now you think about who is your God. He's saying Satan is this big scary thing, and we should not tempt him. Now, of course, God Almighty says the Lord our God says that fear not that the them that can kill the body but fear him that can kill the body and soul in hell that's not Satan that's the Lord God Almighty which is Jesus 
All right. So he says again, we better not tempt the Satan. Uh, uh, excuse me, Satan. Listen. But scary thing, which he is for us. Satan is very big, very scary. We sh we should not uh, tempt him. But we should not tempt him. We should not tempt Satan. Is what he says. Now here we have Jesus being tempted by Satan. But we don't see Satan, or we don't see uh, Jesus tempting Satan. Uh, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency or whatever that word is, for your uh, for your weakness or whatever that word means. I forget. Incontinency, incontinency, uh, uh, lack of control, I think, or something like that. Doesn't matter. Who cares? All right. So let's go to uh, the devil. All right, tempted of the devil. Okay. Again, this is not saying Jesus tempted the devil. It, the devil is tempting Jesus tempted of the devil and when the devil had ended all the temptation <clears throat> he departed from him for a season there's no mention at all of do not tempt the devil or do not tempt Satan all right now let's do it this way Deuteronomy 6 verse 16 ye shall not tempt the Lord your God think about that scary thing which he is for us Satan is very big very scary we, sh we should not uh, tempt him but ye shall not tempt the Lord your God if you're saying you should not tempt Satan then you, what you're saying is you shall not tempt the Lord your God. This guy is worshiping the devil. He sees Satan as his God in his own words. In Matthew 4, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In Luke, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Scary thing, which he is for us. Satan is very big, very scary. We, sh we should not uh, tempt him, but we... I mean, this is insanity. And this guy standing in a church, in a congregation, behind a pulpit, pretending to be a preacher of God. And what's Jesus say? Let's go back to Matthew 24. And when Jesus is asked, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Well, we're seeing signs, aren't we? This is a sign. This is a sign. This is a sign. And real quickly, let's see, what is today? The 18th? This is one day ago. All right, what, was, what was this? 17 hours ago. What was this? One day ago. This is a sign that we are in the end times. Jesus is asked, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? What the very first thing he says is, Take heed that no man deceive you. Many will come in my name, saying, I, Jesus, am Christ and shall deceive many this is a sign of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ these deceivers are signs of his coming these are signs and Jesus goes into pretty good detail you know he, he talks about wars don't don't let that trouble you these things must happen you know there will be 
uh, you know, troubles, those things are just part of the world. But it's very clear that he's giving a description of things getting worse and worse and worse. All right, and we get descriptions of that all throughout the Bible. Things getting worse and worse. Deceivers, evil men, and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And except God shorten those days, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So just like in the days of Noah, only eight were saved. In the days of, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about, there wasn't even ten righteous. And so also when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, shall he find faith on earth? Question mark. So, obviously, there are so many deceivers in the world. And they are getting worse and worse and worse. Look, these guys, they're pretending to be something that they are not. And what they are not is messengers of God. Not at all. Which he is for us. Satan is very big, very scary. We, sh we should not uh, tempt him. What are you talking about, man? I mean... That statement right there is, oh goodness sakes, it's just so wrong. There is one God. Satan is not a God. Satan is not a God. And uh, to me, it's just um, crazy to... Uh, even make that claim uh, you know I was just reading something I don't know if it was this morning or last night uh, about this very subject of well, there's only one God to them that don't believe there are multiple gods but to us there's just one God and there is one God all the other fake gods they have no power at all so if you consider Satan a god, Satan has no power at all. Satan is not a god. May, Satan might be a god to them that don't believe in Jesus, but Satan is no god at all. Okay. <laughs> this idea, oh, we better not tempt Satan, that's not, that's not in the Bible at all. It's God that we should not attempt. Uh, we should not tempt. All right. So, anyways, that's enough. Let's go run through this real quick. So I showed you Matthew 24. Let's do it this way. Um. Oh yeah, let's do it this way. We'll go first of all. Let's go to um, 1 Corinthians 15, and then we'll go to 1 Thessalonians 4. And then we'll go to Revelation 20. All right, we'll make this very clear for anybody that has not figured this out yet. All right, so very clearly in Matthew, I'm telling you, nobody describes the end of the end times eschatology better than our Lord Jesus Christ. He he lays it all out as clearly and plainly as anybody you'll find in the entire Bible. It's very simple. All right, so when um, the actual end happens, the sun will be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then will appear Jesus in the clouds of heaven, and the angels will gather together the elect. We will be lifted up to meet the Lord in the air. All right. And then clearly, uh, our enemy will be gathered at our feet. Just like it says in Genesis 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Just like in Psalm 110, 
till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Also in 1 Corinthians 15, where it says, He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. In Revelation 3, verse 9, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. All right, so Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. We are lifted up. We that are saved are lifted up, and our enemy is gathered at our feet. All right, and we're going to read that in Revelation 20. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, First the dead in Christ, then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is important because when this happens, when all that I just described happens, it's the end of the world. End of the world. Alright, make no mistake about it. It's the end of the world. So when uh, Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up. It is the end of the world. He has put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. All right, so I strongly encourage you to read this stuff. This is great. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. All right, so let's go. Let's get into Revelation 20 and make this very clear. All right. Let's make this very clear. So we go to, there's one more I need to open up here. Revelation 1. This gets missed by so many people, so many young people, so many amateurs, so many people that are beginners. And if you miss this, you're going to miss the whole thing in the book of Revelation. I'm telling you, because without this, you're going to, I mean, it's obvious. When you see these guys, they're trusting in what men say. And they're not trusting in what God says. So the book of Revelation, what's it about? Well, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things. That's important. To show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass. And he, sing, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So these angels are showing John things which must shortly come to pass. So in Revelation 20, and I saw, remember what we just read? To show unto his servants. And I saw, the angel shows John and John says, and I saw an angel come down from heaven. This is a vision. This is a new vision. This is not a chronological, okay, Revelation 19 happened, and then after Revelation 19, then comes Revelation 20. No, this is not a continuation whatsoever. It can't be. It can't be. because If it was, then the whole Bible is wrong illogical and of no use whatsoever if that were the case and it cannot be the case all right so let's make it simple all right we could spend all day debunking what all the false teachers are saying but let's just get right to the truth this is a vision by an angel being shown to John and he says he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season so when did this happen it clearly happened when Jesus died and defeated death and rose back to life 
Jesus, remember, Jesus says, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Remember, he says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. All right, so remember, he changed everything. So before Jesus came along, there was one nation of people. There was the nation of Israel, the nation of God. Right? So then here comes Jesus and he gives the kingdom of God to whosoever liveth and believeth in me. Right? So now the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes. Alright? It's not just one group of people. It is now available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is available to everybody. So now, <clears throat> Satan is not there to deceive the nations. All right, so before in the Old Testament, we had one group of people, and outside of that nation of Israel were the nations deceived by Satan. It was only within the nation of Israel that God uh, watched over, if you will. Outside of that nation were the nations deceived by the devil. Jesus comes along and he says, he does away with that. He's, he breaks down the barrier, if you will, and he makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever liveth and believeth in him. Alright, it's very simple. Now, in verse 4 it says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them. Alright, so if we go back to Revelation 1, it says, Jesus has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. We go to 1 Peter chapter 2, and it says that we are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. We go to Exodus 19. This is important. In Exodus 19 it says, Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. We are royalty. We are a nation of priests. We are kings and priests unto God. So in Revelation 20 when it says, And I saw thrones, we're the ones that sit on heavenly thrones. We that are born of God. We're royalty. We are kings and priests unto God right now. And they that sat upon them, they being us, those of us that are born of God. And judgment was given unto them. All right, remember what we read in uh, John 11? I just showed it to you. I repeated it. And I repeated it again. And I'll repeat it one more time. Jesus says, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now there's a ton I could point to. But the fact is that once you are born of the Spirit of God, you will never die. You have eternal life. Right? Judgment has already been given to us. Nothing can take that away right now. Right now the judgment has already been given to us. Right now we are kings and priests unto God. Right now. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The people that are getting beheaded and killed for the witness of Jesus and the people that are, you know, the, the saved people and then there's the unsaved people who worship the beast okay 
this is going on during the thousand years and it just uh, you know it's astonishing that people can't see it and they willfully ignore it it's astonishing really now the, another thing I gotta point out here you know you hear all these people they, they say oh well, Jesus reigns a thousand years yet the Bible clearly does not say Jesus reigns a thousand years it's not there it says they which is those of us that are born of God we live and reign with Christ right now it doesn't make no mention at all of, of Jesus Christ reigning a thousand years and that would I mean if it did it would nullify the entire Bible it would be it would make the whole entire Bible worthless it would be an error it would make the whole entire book wrong you'd have to throw out the entire Bible it would be a problem that you could not overcome and we'd all be doomed in Luke chapter 1 verse 33 it says and he talking about Jesus shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there is no end so if this said Jesus reigned a thousand years that would be a huge that would nullify every the whole entire Bible that would nullify God and Jesus and everything it's important yeah I mean you can't just come in not knowing diddly squat and making false claims that contradict what the Bible says that's a problem All right those words will come back to haunt you alright so right now we live and reign with Christ all right, and the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished this is the first resurrection who is the first resurrection well I mean it should be pretty obvious if you know the Bible at all it should be pretty obvious Jesus Christ is the first resurrection he even says and plainly and I'm telling you this is why I say there is no better teacher than the Lord Jesus Christ he lays everything out so simply even the biggest dummy a dummy like me can understand it the only thing is though there's a catch you gotta have faith without faith you can't understand nothing don't matter how smart you are don't matter how high your IQ is if you don't have faith you will not see it Jesus said unto her I am the resurrection and then you got all these liars that will come out and say no Jesus is not the resurrection it will be you know me I'll be the resurrection I'll be the first of the first resurrection me and my buddies me and my bowling buddies Right, me and my bowling buddies, we're going to be the first resurrection. I mean, that's what they say. I'm not making that up. I've shown that over and over and over and over and over and over. That's what they say. They totally dismiss what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. And it, it does. It burns my, burns my rear end. All right, so in 1 Corinthians 15 makes it very easy to understand I think every man in his own order Christ the first fruits afterward they that are Christ at his coming so there's only one resurrection of the saved people and that's when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven only one I mean you can't get around this stuff right the sun is dark and the moon shall give her light stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then Jesus appears in the clouds of heaven Revelation 1 behold he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him see isn't that weird because in the Hollywood movie uh, Jesus doesn't come in the clouds of heaven and every eye doesn't see him yet Jesus says all the tribes of the earth shall mourn 
when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and when he comes in the clouds of heaven and all the tribes of the earth are mourned then do the angels gather together the elect and first the dead in Christ then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord you see how contradictory this is with the Hollywood movie Left Behind and in the movie Left Behind people just oh Lord George go you know be plane crashes you know and uh, you know well, let's hope the co-pilot still has a license hey, if you're worried about that and you're hoping for that you got your hope in the wrong place you really do alright so Jesus is the first resurrection there should be no mistake about it All right. every man in his own order Christ the first roots afterward they that are Christ that is coming then comes the end when they shall have delivered up the kingdom to God even the father when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power for he must reign till he has put his enemies under his feet now when this happens you know Paul shows us a mystery here but we could have already deduced it by believing what Jesus said behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump remember what Jesus says and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet that's signifies the end of the world for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this happens then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory remember in a moment in the twinkling of an eye But where am I? In a moment, right there. I'm sorry. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and then in First Thessalonians, for the Lord Himself shall descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Notice here, trump of God, and then of course uh, here, at the for the trumpet shall sound at the last trump, and then again in Matthew 24, um, with the great sound of a trumpet. All right, so connect the dots and you see this is all talking about the same exact moment in time that's when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and every eye shall see him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and we shall be um, lifted up to meet the Lord in the air we'll change in a moment in the twinkling of an eye we will be changed transformed into our glorified bodies okay when this happens then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory all right so they're that we're lifted up our enemies at our feet our enemy is destroyed forever and we're set back down on a new heaven and a new earth where there is no more pain no more sorrow no more suffering no more death and um, all things will be new okay so verse 6 blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection see we are partakers of his resurrection okay Jesus is our leader and we follow him so Jesus has died defeated death and rose back to life and ascended to heaven and promised to return for us all right so we're gonna follow him we're gonna go into the grave and then we're gonna come up out of the grave and then we're gonna ascend to heaven all right just like it says to meet the Lord in the air okay we're gonna follow him he has led the way for us all right and this will all happen at the end of the world Alright, so we are partakers of his 
resurrection. Remember what it says in 1 Corinthians 15. Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. All right, so there's only one resurrection of the saints. All right, Jesus Christ has already resurrected. Then we will, it'll be us, it'll be our turn at his coming. And that's exactly what we're reading here in Revelation chapter 20. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. We are partakers of the Lord's resurrection. On such the second death has no power. Remember what we read in John chapter 11? Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The second death has no power over us, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. We are priests of God right now. We are a kingdom of priests. We are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. All right, so we are kings and priests under God right now. And it, it, it would be pure insanity to say that you're not a priest of God and of Christ and to say that you don't reign with Christ right now. It would be pure insanity. By your own words, you would be confessing that you are not saved. What, if you are saved, why would you do that? It's pure insanity. Now when the thousand years are expired, remember what I've been talking about this whole time. When the th thousand years has expired, it's the end of the world. This is when we are lifted up in the air. Caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Alright. Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head. And thou shalt bruise his heel. Alright. So when, at the end of the world. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. We are lifted up in the air. And our enemy is gathered at our feet. Alright. So. How is it that Satan is loosed? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? That in the Old Testament, like I said, there was one nation of people. Right? Can't dispute that. Outside of that nation was nations deceived by Satan. The kingdom of God was only within the nation of God. But then here comes Jesus, and he makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believeth in him. All right, so now, uh, right now, Satan is not able to deceive the nations like he did before the Old Test or in the Old Testament before Jesus came along. So now, when we are lifted up in the air to meet the Lord in the air, then will Satan, all the people on earth, will be unsaved. So Satan can once again deceive the nations like he did in the Old Testament outside of the kingdom of Israel. Alright, so what's he do? He gathers them together. He shall go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So there's going to be a lot of them. All right, just like in the Old Testament, or in the, when, during Noah's flood, there was only eight people saved, and there had to have been millions, if not a billion people, or not, not millions, but there, there had to have been billions of people, perhaps 25 billion people on the earth, and only eight of them were saved. And so also, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, there will be billions of people gathered at our feet, and fire will come down from God out of heaven and devour them. Now, that's like, uh, that's like, uh, you know, just to, the, uh, to connect the dots here uh, in Genesis 3, verse 15, I will put him to between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is a, this is a fulfillment of that prophecy in Genesis 3. All right. 
and um, so I was going to share something with you. There was somebody that suggested that all the people that are living today is um, greater than the number of people who have lived and died on earth. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's interesting to think. There are a lot of people on earth right now. A lot of people. And so also when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven there's going to be a lot of people that are not saved and um, so our time to reach those that are not saved is greater than ever before but at the same time it's harder than ever before to reach them just because there's so much deception in the world all right now in verse 10 it says and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever now we just read in revelation 19 about the beast and the false prophet being thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone now in Revelation 20 we're reading about the devil being thrown in the lake of fire and brimstone there's a reference to the beast and false prophet to indicate and to let you know this is talking about the same thing that you just read about in Revelation 19 it's not a different event all right it would be nonsensical and just it would just be dumb I mean just dumb you gotta be willingly and purposely dumb dumb on purpose to believe that this is a different event than what you just read in Revelation 19 you gotta be willingly stupid there's really no other way to, to be nice about it and to say it you're stupid if you believe that this is two different events all right. there's no way in the world you can justify making that claim you can say it and then pretend like you didn't say it you can say it and not, and not give any explanation you can't give an explanation you can't it's not true and it's not going to be two different events it's going to be the same event you're just for you're just wanting to believe in Nicolas Cage in the Hollywood movie that's all you're wanting to do you don't want to believe the Bible that's all because there is only one resurrection of the Saints there's only one coming of the Lord Jesus Christ there is only one great day of the Lord and you're just flat-out lying when you say there are multiple ends of the world there are multiple coming of the Lord's Jesus Christ and whatever I mean you're just flat out lying and there's really no other way to there's no nice way to put it you're a liar and you just have to be honest with yourself seriously in verse 11 we have the return of the Lord Jesus Christ this is not a, a second return you know a third return and you know I mean you if you're gonna get stupid why don't you just say well here in chapter 1 Revelation 1 here comes Jesus all right and then Jesus that's his you want to call it second coming or his coming like what we read here and why not get stupid stupid and say okay here's when Jesus comes and then he comes again in Revelation 1 and then we go to Revelation 19 and he comes again and then this is about the 22nd time that he comes in the clouds of heaven and I saw a great white throne that's Jesus and him that sat, sat on it it's Jesus hey, there, it's nobody else it's not you it's Jesus from whose face the earth and heaven fled away 
The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. From whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. This is the same exact event. It's not a separate event. It's not a different event. It's not another person coming. It's the same thing. All you have to do is connect the dots. It really shouldn't be that complicated, man. But there are so many liars out there who don't have any idea at all what they're talking about. None whatsoever. And this is the exact problem that we're told was going to happen. And this is exactly a sign that we are very near the end of the world. The sign is all the deceivers. All the deceivers that are in the world. Many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And this is exactly what we're seeing. And this is all within a day. Deceiver after deceiver after deceiver, day after day after day, people are lying. The end of the world is coming, and when it comes, there will be no more time for the unsaved people. So our time to reach them, and look, unsaved people are people in your own family, it might be even your own children. Today is the day to talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he offers us all right this world is obviously wicked I don't know how anybody doesn't see it I mean I think a lot of people do see it but then do they know that there is a way out of this wicked world you know think about it man. God provided Moses and his people a way out of Egypt so also does Jesus provide us a way out of this wicked world all right and all we have to do is believe in him that's it you know what must I do to be saved to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved it's real simple but do people know that Jesus is real? Do people know that he is our scapegoat to lead us out of this wicked world? Do people know that there's a way out? And uh, so it's on us to preach the gospel to every creature. We are the priest of God and of Christ. We are the ones that are called to go out into the world and to preach the gospel while we can. We have an opportunity today. The opportunity for tomorrow is not yet promised. All right, so think about it. If Jesus comes tonight, it'll be too late for those that are not saved. And I know we like to think about these evil bastards that aren't saved. They're going to hell and good riddance. Well, you know what? You got to you got to seriously consider this because it's not just those evil bastards that are going to hell. It's people close to you. And eternal life sounds great, and it is great. No question about it. It'll be better than what we can imagine. But and when it comes to the end of the world, it's going to be, there's going to be great devastation for those that are not saved. Alright. Terrible sorrow. And, and Luke, it even says that men's hearts will be failing them for fear.
for what's coming upon them. It's going to be a very tragic time. We think about how glorious it is for us, and it certainly is, going to be very sorrowful, very terrible for those that are not saved. So we have an opportunity today. You know, if you if you come across somebody that you know is not saved, take that opportunity to let them know that Jesus is real and that he has done it all for us. He has laid down his life for us and for our sins and for the sins of the whole world that through him God will see us as pure and righteous and that Jesus rose back to life from the dead and so also through him we will resurrect from the dead and Jesus has ascended to heaven and so also will we ascend to heaven and then when all wickedness is destroyed and then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory alright and when it's all finished there will be a new heaven and a new earth and the holy city which is new Jerusalem will descend out of heaven and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes from our eyes there shall be no more death no, neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away so Jesus is going to make everything new and everything is going to be better than what we can imagine right. one thing though one thing the opportunity for that life is only given to those of us now that believe in him and those that do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ this is their last chance this is the last this might be the last day this is the last opportunity that they will have to be saved and I think the torment of not being saved come judgment day is going to be worse than what anybody can imagine and at the same time the joy that we will receive when we are given our new glorified bodies and set back down on a new heaven and a new earth the life to come hereafter I think it's greater than what we can imagine and so let's consider the unsaved I mean it's great oh you're saved I'm saved too that's great yay hallelujah praise the Lord amen that's great but right now let's consider those that are not saved All right. those that got it wrong those that are teaching it wrong let's correct them I don't know how in the world you're gonna make statements like Oh, don't tempt the Satan. Don't tempt Satan. He's big and bad. No, Satan is nothing. Satan is the absence of God. That's it. All right, so anyways, that's enough. Um, if you have any questions, comments, let's share and let's talk about them. Man, this stuff, this stuff is so simple here. And so many people, they want to teach it wrong because they watched a movie. A Hollywood movie starring Nicolas Cage and they said oh the hell with what the Bible says I'm gonna believe in Hollywood movie makers I mean come on man smarten up 